Hello and welcome to Unacademy. A very good morning and welcome to the daily Hindu news analysis. So let's take a look at the topics that we are going to discuss today. These are the seven articles that I have chosen from the Delhi edition of the Hindu. We have three articles for a detailed discussion relevant for both prelims and mains. And we have four small articles that are important for the prelims examination. So before we begin, why don't you support us by pressing the like button and after the live stream ends, do comment below as to what you think about our sessions and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. So let's begin with the Hindu analysis for today by looking at the first article. On the front page of the daily edition, we have a very important article related to environment and ecology. Yesterday, the Supreme Court has passed a very important verdict with regard to the interpretation of the term forest as far as the Forest Conservation Act is concerned. The Supreme Court has called upon the government of India and as well as on the state governments to stick to the wider definition of forests as per the dictionary meaning of forests. So understanding this whole topic along with its background is very, very important because recently the government has brought out the Forest Conservation Amendment Act. Just last year, the Forest Conservation Act was amended along with a new set of rules being notified. And this had raised a lot of controversy in the country. There were accusations that the government was trying to dilute the definition of forests in order to allow the conversion of forest land for non-forest purposes. In this regard, several petitions had been filed in the Supreme Court challenging the validity of the amendment that was done last year. So in this ongoing case, the Supreme Court has passed a ruling for the time being, a three-judge bench headed by the Chief Justice of India, Justice uh, Chief Justice D.Y. Chandrachud. It has passed the interim order and has asked the government to stick to the dictionary meaning of forests when it comes to interpretation of forest land under the Forest Conservation Act. So let's understand the meaning and the significance of this verdict by looking at the entire background related to this topic. Because there is a very important Supreme Court ruling related to this topic, back in 1996, in the Godwarman case, the Supreme Court had widened the definition of forests and it had asked governments to stick to the dictionary meaning of forests. So this has been upheld again by the Supreme Court. And until the further rules are clarified, until forest lands are clearly identified, the Supreme Court has asked the governments to ensure that they stick to the dictionary meaning of forest land. So let's take a look at the history, the background, the constitutional legal provisions regarding the definition of forest, and then we'll understand about the controversy. If you look at forest management in India, in colonial India, the British were primarily interested in cornering the forest resources of India. So they had brought out the Indian Forest Act of 1927 with the primary intention of exploiting India's forest resources. The goal of the British government was never to conserve and protect the forest land. Their primary goal was to ensure that colonial enterprises have access and control over forest resources. But post-independence, this approach of course has changed. Post-independence, forest land had been divided primarily into reserved forests and protected forests. This was a provision that was taken from the Indian Forest Act of 1927 itself. Under this colonial law, it was the state governments which were empowered to notify forest land. State governments had the authority to notify forest land and they could designate forests as reserved forests and as protected forests. They could notify them as reserved and protected forests. Protected forests would have the highest degree of protection followed by reserved forests with very minimal protection being provided for them. Later, when the Wildlife Protection Act was enacted in 1972, it provided for the creation of protected areas such as wildlife sanctuaries, national parks, etc. So these protected forests, they got additional legal protection when protected areas were provided for under the Wildlife Protection Act. 
So essentially, until 1970s, in post-independence India, it was the state governments which had the primary authority when it came to notifying forest land and designating them as reserve forests or as protected forests. So depending upon the designation, a varying degree of protection would be provided for reserved forests and protected forests. As I mentioned, protected forests would enjoy the maximum protection with restriction on human activities, but reserve forests would, uh, would be provided with minimal protection. But in 1976, there was a major constitutional change that was done with regard to forest management and forest conservation in India. Through the 42nd Constitutional Amendment Act, which was passed during the emergency period, the subject of forest was transferred from the state list to the concurrent list. Under the seventh schedule of the Indian Constitution, where the subjects are divided between the center, the, uni the, the state, right? We have the union list, the state list, and the concurrent list, where the subjects are bifurcated, right? So here, forest was under the state list. So through the 42nd Amendment Act, the Constitutional Amendment Act, it was shifted to the concurrent list, thereby giving the center a greater role along with the state governments when it came to conservation and management of forest land. Following this important change, the Forest Conservation Act of 1980 was enacted because by then, the government, the central government felt that deforestation was accelerating. And deforestation, as you know, leads to ecological imbalance. It's detrimental to the environment. So the central government brought out the Forest Conservation Act in 1980 as soon as the subject of forest was moved to the concurrent list. Through the Forest Conservation Act, the powers of the state over notifying forest land and even over diverting forest land for non-forest purposes was restricted through this act. The primary purpose of Forest Conservation Act was to tackle deforestation which was leading to ecological imbalance. The act labels deforestation as detrimental to the environment. And in order to protect and conserve the forest land, the act sought to restrict the powers of the state when it came to notifying forest land and diverting forest land for non-forest purposes. So let's say if a state government had to divert some part of forest land for non-forest private activities, then it had to be done by obtaining prior approval from the central government. Without the center's approval, state governments could no longer divert forest land for non-forest purposes. So be it reserve forests or protected forests, they could not be diverted anymore by the states for non-forest activities, for private activities which could lead to deforestation. So many states opposed these changes as well because they felt that this was leading to excessive centralization. Even though the subject of forest was under concurrent list, where both center and state enjoy the powers, this particular law gave more control to the central government over management of forests in India, and it restricted the powers of the states when it came to transferring or changing the status of forest land. If states had to divert forest land for non-forest purposes, they had to get prior approval from the center. So this was the established constitutional and legal framework in India as far as forest management is concerned. But throughout 1980s, 1990s, there was always a question as to what constitutes forest land. Because as per the Indian Forest Act and as per the Forest Conservation Act, the definitions were varying and it was, there, there was no uniformity when it came to defining forest land in the country. One, we had a colonial interpretation under the 1927 law. Then we had a more modern interpretation of forest land provided through the Forest Conservation Act. So under the Indian Forest Act of 1927, forest lands had been registered and notified by the state governments. Then after Forest Conservation Act came into being, post-1980, forest land was recorded in various government records. So only these recorded forest areas were being treated as forest land as per the provisions of the Forest Conservation Act. But in 1990s, there was a watershed moment with regard to forest management in the country. There was a historic case that reached the Supreme Court of India, which is popularly referred to as 
द गोदर्मन केस दिस वॉज रिलेटेड टू द इलीगल डिफॉरेस्टेशन विच वॉज गोइंग ऑन इन द नीलगिरी इन तमिलनाडु सेवरल पोचर्स एंड प्राइवेट एंटिटीज दे वर इलीगली डिस्ट्रॉइंग द फॉरेस्ट कवर दे वर पोचिंग प्रेशियस एंडेंजर्ड स्पीशीज ऑफ ट्रीज लाइक सैंडलवुड रोजवुड एक्सेट्रा विच वॉज थ्रेटनिंग द बायोडाइवर्सिटी एंड द एनवायरमेंट ऑफ द नीलगिरी रीजन so godwarman had approached the court and the supreme court took up this case along with a bunch of other related petitions that were dealing with illegal deforestation in the country so after examining the case the supreme court realized that the lack of clear definition of forest land was leading to violation of forest conservation act even though we had the forest conservation act and its purpose was to tackle deforestation it wasn't effective because as per the definition of forest there were many areas outside notified forests which were also having good tree cover but they were having no protection under the law only those notified forest lands only they were being accorded protection as per the forest conservation act only those parcels of forests which were notified by the state government under the indian forest act and after 1980 under the forest conservation act only those notified forest lands were having protection but the problem here was that in these notified forest lands the forest had actually degraded in some places but still they were being designated as forest land and being given protection under forest conservation act but the irony was outside these notified forest areas there were few genuine forest lands right according to the dictionary definition any large tract of land which has a dense vegetation a dense tree cover right with good undergrowth should be treated as a forest so there were many areas outside the notified forest land which also had good vegetation which qualified to be treated as a forest but they did not have any protection under the forest conservation act because the definition of forest conservation act and the indian forest act was very limited and restrictive so the supreme court which was looking into this particular issue in the godwarman case gave a broad interpretation a wide interpretation of the definition of forest the supreme court said don't stick to the legal definitions provided in in the law be it the 1980 forest conservation act or the indian forest act of 1927 don't stick to these definitions as they are not providing for adequate protection to our forest land the supreme court said the governments have to abide by the dictionary meaning of forest which is nothing but a large tract of land which has a dense vegetation a dense cover of tree and undergrowth so any such land whether it is notified or not by the state government irrespective of that it would be treated as a forest land and it should be given protection under the forest conservation act so this was the ruling of the supreme court the landmark verdict in the godwarman case in fact this is such an important ruling that it is widely appreciated around the world even the un environment program the wwf which are global organizations dealing with environment protection even they have taken note of this landmark verdict and they have sought to apply this globally instead of sticking to legal definitions of forest land and giving protection only to notified forest areas the supreme court sought to give a wider definition a broader definition by by ordering the governments to treat all forests which fall under the dictionary meaning of forest and provide equal protection under the forest conservation act so this was seen as a landmark verdict and over the last 25 years this verdict under godwarman case in 1996 it has helped in conservation and protection of forest lands which are outside of the notified forest areas but last year the government sought to undermine this verdict at least that is what some experts and activists have been saying last year the government brought out a amendment bill the forest conservation amendment bill 2023 through which some changes have been done with regard to definition of forest and the usage of forest land for non forest activities some major changes have been pushed 
and this amendment bill was passed by the parliament by both Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha. So now it has become an amendment act and the government is framing fresh rules. The Ministry of Environment is framing fresh rules that will be notified under this amendment act. So given the controversial nature of the amendment, several petitions had been filed at the Supreme Court challenging the validity of this amendment. The activists are arguing that the government is trying to dilute the definition of forests. It's trying to undermine the Godwarman verdict of 96, which had given for a wider, broader definition of forest land. So let us look at the changes that were brought out through the Amendment Act and then analyze the importance, the significance of the Supreme Court's verdict that was delivered yesterday. I have taken the highlights of this bill, of the Amendment Bill, from PRS Legislative Research. According to PRS Legislative Research, the bill amends the Forest Conservation Act to make it applicable only to certain types of forest land. Previously, Supreme Court in Godwarman case had said that forest means the dictionary meaning of forest. It doesn't matter what's the definition of the Forest Conservation Act or Indian Forest Act. Forest means the dictionary meaning, which is nothing but any large tract of land with a dense tree cover. So even non-notified forest land was being given protection under Forest Conservation Act. The Supreme Court had strictly prohibited the felling of trees. So private activities, commercial activities were restricted because of that, which led to the conservation protection of our forests. So now the bill was seeking to apply a newer definition only to certain types of land, which includes the land notified as forests under the colonial law. That is, whatever forest land was notified by the state governments as per the Indian Forest Act. And whatever forest land has been entered into government records after the 1980 Act, only these notified pieces of forest will be recognized going forward. Which means the government was narrowing down the definition to those forests which are recorded in government records after 1980 and those forests notified under the Indian Forest Act of 1927. And also the other big change was that if any forest land had been converted for non-forest use before the Godwarman verdict, even they would be exempted. They would not be covered under the protection of Forest Conservation Act. Essentially, it would allow greater commercialization of forests if they are not notified as forests under these laws. If they have already been diverted for non-forest purposes prior to December 12, 1996, that is before the Godwarman verdict, then there is no protection given to such land. So this was one of the key amendments introduced last year to the Amendment Act. It provides protection only to certain types of forest land, which includes the forests notified by the states under the colonial law, the Indian Forest Act of 1927, and those forests which are recorded in government records after 1980, after the Forest Conservation Act came into effect. And however, whatever forest land was converted for non-forest purposes before 1996, before this cutoff date, they will also not get any protection, which essentially meant that the wider definition given by the Supreme Court for forests was being narrowed. It was being constricted through this amendment. And not just that, the government of India was giving exemptions to the definition of forest land. For example, for strategic projects near the border areas within 100 kilometers of India's international borders, in order to take up strategic projects, exemption was being provided. Let's say the border guarding forces or the Indian Army, if they have to expand their military bases and facilities, or if any strategic infrastructure connectivity projects have to be taken up near the border areas, those projects will be completely exempted. Essentially, any forest falling within 100 kilometers of India's borders will be exempted from the protection offered under the Forest Conservation Act. Now, this is something that activists had strongly opposed because India's border areas is home to very rich biodiversity and, and ecosystems. So, large-scale deforestation in the name of national security and in the name of strategic projects could dilute India's environmental standards. So this was seen as another controversial provision. And the state governments had to get prior approval 
before they could divert any forest land for non-forest private activities. So state governments also had a problem with this. It was reiterating the earlier provision of 1980. It was giving more control to the center. Without the center's approval, the states couldn't divert forest land for non-forest private activities. And apart from that, for certain recreational activities, like establishing zoos, safaris, or ecotourism activities, complete exemption has been provided through the amendment. Let's say the government wants to promote ecotourism in a notified forest land. Or let's say government wants to establish a zoological park or safari facilities to attract tourists in a forest area. Those projects will be fully exempted under the Protection of Forest Conservation Act. So that is the reason why the amendment that was done last year triggered a lot of controversy. It was opposed by environmental activists. That's why they approached the Supreme Court. Some states also had concerns that it was leading to further centralization of forest conservation. States already had a problem with the Forest Conservation Act of 1980 because it had restricted their powers to divert forest land for non-forest purposes. Now it is reiterating that and giving more authority to the center while granting approval for these private projects. So some states also had opposed the amendment by citing that it was leading to centralization of forest management and forest conservation. So on this note, the activists, the environmental activists, they had approached the Supreme Court and they had challenged the amendment that was done last year. So now the Supreme Court has said that until the final rules are brought out and until all forest land is notified, all the records are brought out and notified, until then, both center states and even union territories, they have to follow the dictionary meaning of forests. The Supreme Court has reiterated the importance of the Godwarman verdict. Until this is clarified, until the final hearing happens, until the position is clarified, the governments have to abide by, they have to stick to the dictionary meaning, the dictionary definition of forest land and give protection to all such forests as per the Forest Conservation Act. The petitioners were arguing that under the amendment, under section 1A, there was a substantial dilution that was done to the definition of forests. As I was mentioning, only certain categories of forest land is being recognized following the amendment. One is the forest land notified under Indian Forest Act of 1927 and forest land recognized after 1980, which are entered in government records under the Forest Conservation Act. Only these forest lands were being given protection. So petitioners were opposing this as it was undermining the Godavarman verdict. But the central government defended its position. In the hearings that were held in front of the three judge bench, the center defended its position and said that we are not diluting the definition of forest land, rather we have expanded the definition. Because through the amendment, the government records being considered to identify forest land has been expanded. The amendment provides for any government record of states and union territories including local authorities, including by recognized communities, councils, even these records will be considered to identify forest land according to the new amendment. So the center said, we are not just looking at the government records of the center and the state, we are looking at local records, local administrative records, community and local body council, council body held records as well to identify the forest land in the country. So according to the center, this is an expansion of the definition. But petitioners were against it because clearly it was undermining the Godwarman verdict. It would no longer provide protection for non-forest land outside the notified areas. So that is why they had approached the court challenging these amendments. So now the Supreme Court has ruled that until the issue is clarified, until a final verdict is delivered, until all the forest land is brought out into the public domain as per the government records, until then the governments have to stick to the dictionary meaning. They have to continue to follow the Godavarman verdict of 1996. That is the interim order passed by the Supreme Court. It has also directed the Environment Ministry to bring out the consolidated list of forest land in India. To go through all the government records of the center, states, union territories, local bodies and bring out one consolidated list of forest land. And until this exercise is completed, 
until this exercise is completed, the definition of forest would mean the dictionary meaning of forest. Is that clear? The Supreme Court has set a further date for a next round of hearing in July 2024. So until then, governments will have to abide by the Godavarman verdict and assume that forest would mean the dictionary meaning of forest and provide protection to all these forests as per the Forest Conservation Act. The court also has directed the center to not establish any zoological parks, safaris or ecotourism facilities until the final approval is provided, until the final hearings are held in this particular case. So this verdict is seen as a big victory for environmental activists and this is seen as a big win for forest conservation in the country. So that is the importance of this verdict. But however, this is not the final verdict. As the Supreme Court has said, it has given time for the center and the states to bring out a consolidated list of forest land as per government records. And this will be submitted in the coming days. And if the court is satisfied that these notified forest lands are enough, then the Supreme Court might uphold the amendment that has been done. And essentially, it would reverse the Godwarman verdict. So this is something we have to wait and watch. And that is why the topic becomes very, very important. Now, please note, we have these free special classes running on the Unacademy app. Today, this is the schedule. We have three classes lined up for you today. Two history classes and one geography class taken by Abhishek sir and Mukesh sir. Do attend these classes live and the links for these sessions, they are provided in the video description below. Now, let's look at an important editorial from today's newspaper. On page number eight, there is an editorial dealing with India's exports and imports and it mainly focuses upon the impact of the Red Sea crisis on India's exports. The editorial is bringing out some data to talk about the impact of the ongoing security situation in the Red Sea and how it has impacted India's exports. This is something we have been discussing over the last few weeks. Ever since the Gaza war broke out, various Shia extremist groups, which are sponsored by Iran, they have, they have widened the conflict in the West Asia region, leading to the larger destabilization of West Asia. As Israel has gone to war in Gaza in order to target Hamas, which carried out the brutal attack on 7th October, right? Since this war began in Gaza, there are other Iranian proxies in the region which have started targeting Israel. One would be Hezbollah in Lebanon, which is another Shiite extremist outfit, which is also sponsored by Iran. Just like Iran sponsors Hamas, it has also backed Hezbollah in Lebanon to target Israel. And another outfit which Iran has sponsored in the region happens to be the Houthis, the Houthi rebels of Yemen, the Houthi extremists of Yemen. This is another Iranian proxy in the region. So the Houthis have started targeting commercial ships passing through this critical water body over here. They have fired multiple ballistic missiles and drones which are applied by Iran, assembled in Yemen. These missiles and drones have been fired at commercial ships, not just targeting ships linked with Israel, but they have randomly targeted every other commercial vessel passing through this important shipping lane. Now, this shipping route that you're seeing here is extremely crucial for India and as well as for the global economy. So, this shipping route that connects Arabian Sea over here with Horn of Africa, this is Horn of Africa and this is the Gulf of Aden region. Right? It connects with a narrow choke point over here, a narrow strait called the Bab al Mandeb Strait. The Bab al Mandeb Strait is a strategic choke point located in a vital location, and that is where the Houthis of Yemen have a strong presence. They have the ability to carry out blatant strikes against commercial ships in this narrow corridor. So, this route will enter the Red Sea over here, which is again a narrow shipping channel and reaches the Suez Canal in Egypt. The Suez Canal is another strategic choke point. Again, it's a narrow shipping lane 
which further connects with the Mediterranean Sea and with the European market. So this route from the Mediterranean till the Arabian Sea via Red Sea and Bab al-Mandeb is extremely crucial for the global economy and especially for India as it offers the shortest route between Indian Ocean and the Atlantic. It is crucial for trade between the Eastern and Western Hemisphere. Right? It is critical for India's exports to Europe, for India's exports towards the Americas region. So such a vital shipping lane has been threatened by the repeated attacks that the Houthis have carried out and this has completely disrupted shipping through the Red Sea. So as a result, many ships have been diverted. Many shipping companies are not taking a chance and they are diverting the cargo around Africa. They have gone back to the pre-Suez Canal days. They have gone back many decades ago essentially, right? Because Suez Canal's construction in Egypt had created the shorter route between Europe and India. So prior to that, any ship that would pass from India to Europe, essentially from Indian Ocean to the Atlantic, they would move around Africa, turn near Cape of Good Hope in South Africa and then enter the Indian Ocean, most likely passing through Mozambique Channel over here between Mozambique and Madagascar. So this was the age-old shipping route, but as you can see, it's a much longer route. It takes more number of days, the cost of transportation will increase, the fuel cost, right, this will spill over and it will add to the export cost, the import cost as well. The logistics cost will increase and this could spill over into higher commodity prices, even leading to inflation around the world. So this is something India and the whole world was worried about. But quite interestingly, the trade data which has been recently brought out doesn't show the immediate impact of this crisis on Indian exports. That is something very interesting. The recent export data that has been published by the government of India shows that India's exports has slightly increased for two consecutive months. For December and January, our exports have seen a slight increase and the cost of the Red Sea crisis has not affected the Indian exports as of now. But doesn't mean we are going to escape this crisis. The editorial feels that this impact will be felt down the line. It's a cascading effect which will be felt by India, by Indian exporters down the line. This could increase the cost of transportation, the cost of insurance, because ships, if they are passing through risky routes, the insurance premium will shoot up exponentially, which will add to the cost of transportation. So this is something that has worried the global economy. Almost every country is concerned about the crisis happening here, as it could have a domino effect, a spillover effect on the global economy. Almost every major commodity price could shoot up, leading to wider inflation. That too at a time when many major economies are looking at a deflationary trend. If you look at, for example, Japan, it has recently entered a deflationary cycle. China is facing a massive crisis in its housing market and it is staring at a deflationary trend. The United States is appearing to head towards a recession. Many other developed economies in Europe, even Australia, they're all witnessing stagnating growth or decelerating growth. So at this crucial point, if the Red Sea crisis were to have a wider impact, if the prices were to spill over into exports and imports, this would further add burden on the global economy and definitely it is going to impact India. But as of now, the interesting fact is that as of now, we are not seeing a direct impact on Indian exports because of the Red Sea crisis. Even our import bill has not gone up. But again, this could be because our imports in general has reduced slightly. Over the last two quarters, Indian imports have gone down slightly. So it could be because of that. Even the trade deficit is pretty much under control. Because largely because even Indian economy has been staring at a slight slowdown because of the overall slowdown in the global demand. So our exports and imports have been subdued to an extent. Even though exports have seen a slight growth in the last two months, key sectors have not seen major improvement. When it comes to India's exports, major labor intensive sectors such as gems and jewelry, then other capital and labor intensive sectors, right? They have not seen much growth in their export volume. So this could just be a, a temporary uh, relief for India. But the writer uh, or the editorial 
right? The editorial team at Hindu, they expect the crisis to hit the Indian economy maybe at a later stage, maybe in the coming months, we are likely to feel the impact of the ongoing crisis in the Red Sea. Already, many countries have deployed their navies, including the US. The US has launched a coalition mission called Operation Prosperity Guardian, under which US Navy is working with a few friendly navies to stabilize the region and to counter the threat posed by the Houthis. UK and US, they have even launched military strikes, air strikes into Yemen, targeting Houthi camps. Indian Navy is also proactively deployed here to stabilize the region and to protect the shipping lane. Indian Navy has been playing a key role to offer protection and escort to the commercial ships passing through this region and even to counter piracy in the Horn of Africa, Gulf of Aden region. So despite these efforts, the ongoing crisis is likely to impact trade. The cost is likely to increase. It's just that we haven't felt the impact as of now. And according to the editorial, we might feel its impact down the line in the coming months. So given the adverse global environment, the global economic environment, the editorial is suggesting that India should gear up, should prepare for the upcoming challenges with regard to our exports and imports and the logistics cost involved in shipping. Next, we have another important column on page number eight that deals with India's relations with Greece. It's not very often that you read about India-Greece relations. Many of you might think it's a, a very small relationship. It's an inconsequential relationship. But honestly, over the last few years, India has prioritized its relationship with Greece. The topic is in news because Greece Prime Minister is visiting India starting from tomorrow. And he would be attending the Raisina Dialogue, which is organized in New Delhi. Raisina Dialogue is a flagship diplomatic event organized by ORF, Observer Research Foundation which is a leading foreign policy think tank in India. And this event is funded and sponsored by the Ministry of External Affairs. So MEA works closely with this think tank called ORF to organize Raisina Dialogue, which is a, a track 1.5 diplomatic event. It brings top government leaders from prime ministers and presidents to diplomats, military officers, intelligence officers together, along with strategic experts, think tanks, media, journalists, right? And even academy and students, they all assemble in New Delhi for the Raisina Dialogue, which is a flagship event in India. It's built on the lines of the Shangri-La Dialogue in Singapore or the Munich Security Conference that we discussed recently. So the Greek Prime Minister who's visiting India will be the chief guest as well at Raisina Dialogue. And this is an opportunity through which India will be stepping up its relations with Greece. Now, this relationship has acquired a lot of significance due to some recent events. And just last year, Prime Minister Modi became one of the first Indian Prime Ministers to pay a historic visit to Greece in August 2023. Last year, PM Modi visited the country and cemented a strategic partnership between India and Greece. So the writer is essentially talking about the potential that exists in India-Greek relations. So here I would like to give you a historical perspective and a broader perspective about India-Greece relations. Because of one recent event, which I'm going to discuss now, the topic of India-Greece relations can be very important for the exams. So let's take a quick look at the historical relationship and let's talk about some recent events which has added new momentum to India-Greek relations. See, India and Greek or, or Greece, we share ancient relations that date back thousands of years. As many of you know, Athens is considered the oldest democracy in the world. Today, it's the prime capital of Greece. And since ancient times, thousands of years ago, India and Greece have shared very close historical trade diplomatic relations. There are enough evidences to indicate the strength of these relations that existed thousands of years ago. For example, if you look at few Ashokan edicts, there are documented evidences mentioning strong diplomatic trade and cultural ties between India and the then Greek Empire. As you all have studied in history, Alexander, 
in his campaign towards Asia had reached very close to northwestern India, today's Pakistan. Right? Then uh, Kautilya or Chanakya records in his treatise, epic treatise, Arthashastra, regarding a Greek ambassador, a Yavin ambassador who had visited the court of Chandragupta Maurya. Right? A very popular figure as well, Megasthenes. Chanakya mentions the visit of Megasthenes to the Mauryan court, clearly indicating strong diplomatic trade and cultural ties between India and Greece. So this is an age-old ancient relationship that is built on a very strong foundation. In fact, if you look at Gandhara art or Indo-Greek architecture, there are clear influences, Indo-Greek influences found all across the region. Even in today's Pakistan-Afghanistan region, for example, right, where Gandhara art is still found, where you find the relics of Gandhara art at least, it's a clear in Indo-Greek fusion. There is Indo-Greek fusion architecture as well. So there are enough historical evidences to point towards these ties between India and Greece. But the most important and interesting point is that recently a trade corridor has been announced called the IMEC Corridor, India Middle East Economic Corridor. This was launched at the G20 summit that was held last year in Delhi. India was holding the presidency of G20. So during the New Delhi G20 summit, the IMEC corridor was announced under the leadership of United States along with India. This proposed corridor which will link India with West Asia, particularly with UAE, Saudi Arabia and Jordan and Israel. This route will connect with the ancient Piraeus port in Greece to further link with Europe. Even France and Germany are part of this corridor. So to extend this corridor into Western Europe, Greece will form a vital link. The strategic Haifa port of Israel over here in the Mediterranean will be connected with the ancient strategic Piraeus port in Greece. Now this is what I wanted to talk about. When the IMEC corridor was announced, popular historian William Dalimpil who is an expert in Indian history, he spoke about the ancient trade linkages through the spice route that existed between India's west coast, the Gulf, the Arab region and the Piraeus port in Greece. William Darimpil talks about the trade linkages that existed via the space spice route, how Indian traders established settlements all across this region from today's Saudi Arabia to Egypt, right? And how this route was facilitating a direct trade link with the Piraeus port, which is an ancient port in Greece. There are documented evidences of traders from Malabar region along the Kerala coastline and also money lenders and financiers from Gujarat region having traded with this region and having their trade outposts in Piraeus port in Greece. So this proposal to revive this historical link and connect India with the Middle East region or West Asia region further with Europe via the Piraeus port holds a lot of significance. And also don't forget, India and Greece are today facing similar security and strategic challenges. If India is concerned about the crisis in Red Sea and in West Asia, Greece also has a similar concern. Because we both are located at the outer boundaries of West Asia region. So whatever adverse developments are happening in Gaza, in Israel, in Lebanon, directly spills over into Mediterranean and affects the interests of Greece. Similarly, adverse developments in Red Sea, in West Asia, spills over into Indian Ocean, affecting Indian interests. So it's only natural for India and Greece to come together in the defense and strategic domain as well. In fact, India and Greece have defense and strategic relations and we have a military exercise as well. So please take this as an exercise. Find out the names of the military exercises between Indian Armed Forces and the Greek Armed Forces and mention that in the comments below. Plus we also have a strong economic relationship, a trading relationship. There are many Greek companies which have invested in India. There are many Indian conglomerates which have investments in Greece. For example, in construction sector, in, uh, in port management, right? in uh, airport construction, 
there are Indian companies involved in projects in Greece. One of the major upcoming airports in Greece is being partly built by an Indian company. So there is a lot of economic interaction, there is flow of goods and investments. So this is a right opportunity for India Greece to step up the partnership because they have common concerns, threats and opportunities that are present. So on this note, I conclude the detailed discussion of the big articles. Now let's head towards the prelim section and take a quick look at the smaller articles in today's paper. On page number six, the Hindu carries an image of an ongoing military exercise called the Milan Naval Exercise, which is organized by Indian Navy off the coast of Vishakhapatnam. In this image, you can see a helicopter, the MH-60 Romeo Seahawk helicopter. So I feel these are two important prelims related topics. The Milan Naval Exercise being hosted by India. You should know what is this naval exercise? When was it started? Which countries participate in it? Behind the Milan Naval Exercise, there is a rich history. This exercise was started back in 1996, 95-96. Today, more than 50 countries which are friendly to India, which are like-minded countries, they participate in the Milan Naval Exercise. This is one of the biggest military exercises organized by India. It's a multilateral exercise. Initially, it was started as part of India's Look East policy, which was launched by the Narsimha Rao government in 1990s. India had started paying more attention to Southeast Asian countries and to step up defense relations with them, the Milan Naval Exercise was started in 1995-1996 by bringing some friendly navies together. So in the initial years, countries like Indonesia, Singapore, Sri Lanka, Thailand and others were participating in this military exercise which was seen as an extension of our Lukis policy. But over the years, we have gradually expanded the exercise to bring in many other countries from across the Indo-Pacific. Now, today it is seen as a continuation of our Indo-Pacific strategy and Act East policy. Because Act East policy, which is an upgradation of Look East, has expanded India's focus towards East Asia and the broader Pacific region. And it aligns with India's Indo-Pacific strategy. So this naval exercise is organized once in every two years. It's a biennial naval exercise. And today, many major naval powers, which are stakeholders in the Indo-Pacific, they all participate in the Milan exercise. It's not just our neighbors like Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Maldives. That's quite interesting. Maldives is also a part of it. Despite the recent friction, Maldives has agreed to participate in this edition of the Milan exercise. So apart from our South Asian neighbors, there are many Southeast Asian, East Asian countries and Indo-Pacific powers, which also participate in the exercise. So you have United States, Australia, Japan. Essentially, all the quad navies are involved. All the quad navies, which also participate in the Malabar exercise, which includes the four quad countries, they're all participating in Milan, along with South Korea, Vietnam, which are all strategic partners of India in Southeast Asia and East Asia region. So it has brought all these navies together and it is being held in Bay of Bengal off the coast of Vishakhapatnam. So the image that you saw of a helicopter is the MH-60R or MH-60 Romeo helicopters. It is produced by Sikorsky, which is a US aerospace defense manufacturer. India has procured this advanced helicopter from the US. It's part of India-US defense relations. The C variant of this helicopter is called the Sea Hawk. It's a multi-role, multi-mission helicopter. We have primarily procured this for our aircraft carrier, the indigenous aircraft carrier, INS Vikrant. It can perform multiple operations. It can be used as a transport helicopter. It can be used for search and rescue operations, for evacuation. But more importantly, it is known for its lethal war fighting capabilities. It is known for its maritime surveillance reconnaissance capabilities. So it can help in scanning the waters around the Indian Ocean. And it is a specialist helicopter with regard to anti-submarine warfare and anti-surface warfare to target naval ships, 
or to target submarines underwater. The Romeo helicopter, the Seahawk helicopter is seen as a key asset. India has primarily procured this to strengthen its maritime security across the Indo-Pacific. And we have done this by keeping China's naval interference in the Indian Ocean in mind. Given that Chinese Navy, Chinese submarines, they frequently enter the Indian Ocean, right? This is part of India-US collaboration to jointly counter the rising Chinese presence in the Indo-Pacific. So the land variant of this helicopter, which is used by the Army and Air Force, is called the Black Hawk, which is also a very popular helicopter. But India right now has procured only the Sea variant, the Sea Hawk variant, which has been procured for the Indian Navy. It's been inducted by the Indian Navy, mainly to operate from the aircraft carriers. Next, on page 15, there is a reference to a naval mission launched by European Union. The European Union has launched a naval mission in the Red Sea to counter the threat posed by the Houthis. To deal with the Houthi crisis, the EU navies have launched a joint mission known as Aspides. It's a Greek word for shield. It's a Greek word that translates to shield. So this naval mission is launched by European Union. This is parallel to Operation Prosperity Guardian launched by the US. If you remember, when US launched Operation Prosperity Guardian, many European countries were also supposed to be a part of it. But later, they withdrew from Operation Prosperity Guardian because they were not comfortable in being part of a US-led military mission. So France, Spain, Germany and others, even Italy, they were all supposed to be part of Operation Prosperity Guardian. But given that it was a US-led military mission, all the European countries had withdrawn from Operation Prosperity Guardian. So now the EU countries are launching their own naval mission to protect the Red Sea shipping lane and to counter the threat posed by the Houthis. And this mission is called Aspides. So please make a note of this for your prelims. Coming to the last article from page 15, it deals with India-Sri Lanka relations and what India has done to protect and uplift the Tamil minorities in Sri Lanka. As you know, Tamil minorities in Sri Lanka have faced a lot of atrocities, oppression, as a result of the ethnic conflict, where they have been targeted by the radical Sinhala Buddhists who are in majority. It was this ethnic divide that triggered the ethnic war in Sri Lanka, where Tamil militant organizations had fought a liberation war against the Sri Lankan government. So this ethnic conflict, which dates back to 1980s, it had consumed and destroyed Sri Lanka and the Tamil minorities took a bigger hit. Be it the Sri Lankan Tamils, who had settled centuries ago in Sri Lanka, or the Indian Tamils, who were recently transported from southern India to Sri Lanka by the British. So both the category of Tamils have faced a lot of discrimination and oppression at the hands of radical Sinhala Buddhists and also at, at the hands of the discriminative policies of the Sri Lankan government. So to protect the Tamil population and to assist the war-affected Tamil communities, India has many developmental projects going on in Sri Lanka. One major developmental project sponsored by India is the housing project. The housing project has been undertaken in the northern province where the Jaffna Peninsula is located. And we have also launched new housing projects in eastern province of Sri Lanka. Because this is where the Tamil minority population is concentrated, in the northern province of Sri Lanka and in the eastern province of Sri Lanka. So these housing projects were started by the then Manmohan Singh government. When the last phase of the civil war was held between 2006 and 2009, this was the last phase of the civil war where the Tamil militant group LTTE was crushed by the Sri Lankan government. During this last phase of the war, which was led by then President Mahinda Rajapaksa and his brother Gotbaya Rajapaksa, who was the then defense minister, it was accused that Sri Lanka had used massive force against uh, Tamil minorities in the name of targeting LTTE. Apparently, Tamil civilians had been targeted leading to war crimes and large-scale human rights violations. So after the war ended in 2009, 
and after LTT had been wiped out, India stepped in to help the Tamil community and to provide housing facilities to them. This has been a major development initiative of India. It was started by the then Manmohan Singh government and it has continued under the Modi government as well. India had built around 15,000 houses after the war ended in order to rehabilitate the internally displaced people or IDPs. Tamils in Sri Lanka had become internally displaced. Just like refugees flow into another country during wars or disasters, seeking asylum in a foreign country. Those who get displaced within a country due to war, conflict, disaster, they are called IDPs or internally displaced people. So to rehabilitate the Tamil community which had been internally displaced, India built thousands of houses and, and this is a way through which India protected the interests of the Tamil minorities. So this housing project is continuing, a new phase has been launched and it has been dedicated and it's called Bharat Lanka a Housing Project. It's been named as Bharat Lanka Housing Project. So Sri Lanka's president Ranil Vikramasinghe has dedicated these houses built by India, funded by India and he has reiterated Sri Lanka's commitment to protect the Tamil minorities and to provide for their upliftment, to protect their economic, political and social rights. So this is what you should note down. Please be aware of Bharat Lanka Housing Project. So this completes my discussion of today's The Hindu Newspaper. You can take a look at the mains practice questions which are based on the key topics that we discussed in today's session. Please use these questions for your answer writing practice and do let me know how the session went in your comments. If you liked it, do press the like button, share the video with other aspirants and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. That is it for today. We'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for watching. Take care.